I'd like to introduce the March Mentor of the Month, Dr. Stephen Hughes. He's a professor of surgery and the chief of the Division of General Surgery at the University of Florida in Gainesville, Florida. So a few questions to get started. Um, you're a pancreatic biliary surgeon. And what first interested you in PBS surgery? Well, I think it'll make people kind of feel good about the fact that I did not find pancreatic biliary surgery right away. I actually went to med school to be an orthopedist, uh, figured out at my first rotation in orthopedics that that wasn't for me, and then thought I'd be a heart surgeon. And when I was a resident, I thought I was going to be a general thoracic surgeon. In fact, my lab experience was in esophageal cancer biology. It wasn't until I was a fourth clinical year uh, resident that I realized that it was the pancreas that I was passionate about. So I came to it quite late. So what was it that initially piqued your interest? What, what did it for you in fourth year? Um, to be honest with you, I came to realize while I was capable of the fine technical skills for sort of like reconstructive surgery, a cardiac or vascular or whatnot, what I really enjoyed was dissection. And coupled with my lab experience in the complex biology of cancer, and it is a clinical challenge, um, uh, was what really made me want to be a pancreatic surgeon. The other thing people don't really realize though is I'm also boarded in critical care. I really like critically ill patients. So you put these big operations that have the potential of making people sick that you have to get them through. It really kind of came together for me is why I really love what I do. So you took that technical challenge and really molded it and changed it and have become a pioneer in laparoscopic whipple surgery. So what has what motivated you to try this and develop it? What were some of the challenges associated with creating this sort of a, a new approach to surgery? Sure. Um, well, I think, you know, one of the key things, the great things about being in academics is, is you want to challenge the standard of care, not just practice it. And as I was getting started in my career, it was around 2000, 2001, the moratorium on minimally invasive colon surgery was lifted because the notion that port site recurrences were unacceptable and that the biology of laparoscopy was causing port site recurrences finally was debunked. And so all of a sudden, I was at the VA and there were a few hundred cases a year of laparoscopic colon surgery be done. And so we just started really doing laparoscopic surgery. It really kind of opened up the field to sort of big operative procedures uh, done with the laparoscope. And shortly thereafter, 2001, 2002, we started doing laparoscopic distal pancreatectomies. And by about 2005, 2006, it became apparent that the laparoscopic approach to distal pancreatectomy had real clinical advantages. I mean, I became convinced of it. And so I started to just ask the question, would those benefits actually also be realized in laparoscopic Whipple? And I wasn't the only person at the time. There were others around the, the world who were asking this question. And perhaps the two that really got uh, involved with me as I thought about this were Dr. Palanivalu from India and Mike Kendrick at Mayo. And we started to kind of get together at meetings and talk a bit about what one or the other was doing. Palanivalu was ahead. Kendrick was ahead of me as well. But ultimately, there was a lot of opportunity. I learned how to do the operation um, on cadavers at first, um, practicing through an IRB approved process at the University of Pittsburgh, and then ultimately started to do the dissection on patients under uh, informed consent. Um, and I did a bunch that way, and then ultimately did the reconstruction as well. But it was probably about a year, year and a half in the process to finally get to the point where I had actually done my first laparoscopic Whipple in around 2007, the end of 2007. So you also have a, a lab. You were recently awarded a $300,000 uh, PANCAN grant uh, from the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. Um, tell us more about your basic science research and, and pushing the envelope again, not settling for the, for the standard, but trying to change, change the world of pancreatic cancer. Uh, so, um, I didn't get that right to begin with, to be honest. Remember, I said that I thought I was going to be a thoracic surgeon. So for the first decade of my career, I actually really studied esophageal cancer biology. And if I were to give someone advice, I'd like, you got to align what you're trying to do with your research efforts with what you do clinically. And I made that mistake. When I came here to Florida in 2010, what I had learned along the way is that what's really valuable as a surgeon scientist is access to our patients, histories, and there's their biospecimens. So we immediately began to create a pipeline of tissues, um, surgical specimens and, and blood and, and byproducts of blood to the lab and an informed consent process where we could then also clinically annotate those specimens, you know, uh, with outcome. And we then immediately put those into use within the lab. What became apparent was is that the beauty of being a clinician scientist is that 
you start to realize things where there are problems in clinical medicine that you realize in the lab. And this was a simple thing. The people I was working with just didn't think it was worth doing at all. What we noticed was is that when we compared soluble protein concentrations in cancers to those of even chronic pancreatitis, there were huge differences. And I realized that that might be able to solve a problem with cytology for the diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. But then when it got even more interesting is, is that those signatures may actually be able to predict prognosis. We could separate based on protein concentrations from a fine needle aspirate within the pancreas. Somebody who was only going to live nine months after their Whipple versus somebody who had a really good chance of being alive at five years. And so the grant's really about trying to translate this discovery into actual clinical practice to fill a hole in our ability to make the diagnosis of pancreatic cancer from a fine needle aspirate, which actually unfortunately is very specific but not very sensitive. So we're trying to overcome that sensitivity problem. So you have this really exciting research. You are pioneering laparoscopic Whipple surgery. How do you balance all of that? You're an educator. How do you balance all of that with your life at home? You have three grown children. Uh, what, how, do, how do you make all this work? Well, to be honest with you, sometimes you don't. <laughs> you know, I've made mistakes there too. I think we've talked before about the fact what I'm particularly happy about is I actually figured out a way to be both of my boys' little league baseball coaches, you know, coach pitch. I actually threw a baseball to them and their friends. And that meant having to be at a field at 5 o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon for like 13 weeks in a row. And as a surgeon, you got to realize that that has to be an absolute priority and you have to work out a deal with the people you work with to know that that's going to be something that your boys can rely on. Um, I've been uh, probably less reliable for my wife, God bless her, but we've been married 29 years, so we've kind of figured it out over time. I think the important thing is that I realized that every night when I go home, there's more that I could do at work. Um, and unfortunately, every morning when I leave the house, I realize there's more that I can do as a parent and as a husband. And um, you got to make peace with that and have an ongoing dialogue with the people who you care about so that you don't take advantage of them and you don't get pulled into one bucket versus the other only to totally dis, uh, disrespect what's a, what you owe that other bucket. Does that answer it fairly well? I mean, I'm not perfect at it. There's no doubt about it. I'm not perfect at it. You know, but the it, best you can do is try. It, it lets us all know that, uh, that, that it's it easy to look like you're doing it all, but we all struggle with with these sorts of things. So. Uh, oh, I've gotten in trouble at home once or twice, <laughs> that's for sure. And I also think the other thing I'd mention is that I think don't underestimate the value of family vacations. And, and, and that includes uh, vacations just with your significant other, you know, because sometimes you just have to get away, the, the two of you. And um, so I, I highly suggest that those always remain top priorities. Date night is a real deal. So what's your advice to a young faculty member, somebody who's interested in pursuing academic surgery? Uh, advice, advice is a clinician, advice is a scientist. Um, advice as an educator? What are, what are priorities or things that they should focus on? I'd, I'd give them two pieces of advice. I think one is, as I've already said, I think the key to being happy in an academic environment is that you need to be there to do what you care about, which is to challenge the standard of care. I mean, if you're just intrinsically curious about how you could do something better for your patients, then an, a, a, an academic medical center is where you need to be. So if that's how you're feeling, that's the real motivation. What I've seen for success as far as happiness is people wanting to challenge the standard of care. You don't have to have a benchtop lab. You don't have to have mice running around in some animal facility to do that. But you have to be better than just the standard of care. You have to know it cold and understand there's areas where we think we can do better and have ideas and then the energy to actually test that hypothesis. The second thing I'd have to say about that is, is that mentorship is not upon the mentor. It's upon the mentee. Now, there's good mentors and there are bad mentors, but you don't know whether you've got one or the other until you as a mentee have actually sought them out. And I, um, I think I've had at least a couple dozen mentors in my career. You can pick somebody for a particular thing. I have basic science mentors. I have administrative mentors. I have life you know, lessons mentors. But they have not come and found me and said, how can I help you? I have come and knocked on their door and said, I need your help. And so my best advice to people are, is go ask somebody, how should I do this? Or would you help me with this? Realize then that the benefit for a mentor 
is to watch the mentee succeed, and that's all they should expect. There should be no more give than just the satisfaction of watching the mentee succeed. And so if you engage in a relationship with a mentor and they're looking for more than that, you may want to think twice about whether they're really the right person to mentor you for whatever it is that you need to be mentored. But those would be the two pieces of advice I'd give for a young faculty member. The job of finding a mentor is yours and challenge a standard of care and never give up on your curiosity because that's where the fun comes. So where do you see the future of pancreatic surgery next five or ten years? Where are we going from here? Yeah, I, I think the robot's here to stay, to be honest. It, it, it's um, surprising to me, um, but clearly the platform has provided benefit, and, uh, and, and I think it's really getting a foothold. Uh, uh, there's no question people seek me out because from a patient's perspective, they strongly desire a minimally invasive approach to their pancreatic surgery, even if our data doesn't show that it is transformative. I think the laparoscopic approach is iteratively a little bit better than a big open incision. There's some benefit to it, but who we shouldn't even try to do laparoscopic, there's still a lot of questions. But I think there's going to be a general trend towards more minimally invasive surgery. Perhaps the most interesting thing, now we actually have systemic therapy for pancreatic cancer. It starts to raise the question about whether or not metastectomy is appropriate in select patients. And I think you're going to probably see in the next two, five, ten years that actually selective patient uh, will benefit from metastectomy. And who those patients should be, what the underlying uh, driving, onco uh, driving oncologic genes are, all of those things have yet to be sorted out. But that's what I see in the next five to ten years. Any other uh, words of wisdom for moving forward with uh, for members of the SSAT, especially uh, residents and uh, medical students? The only other thing I'd say is that I think a lot of people as they get started are very afraid of, of narrowing their clinical focus. I hear it very often, people as they finish training, I like general surgery because of the bread and, you know, the breadth of things. And even within colorectal, I, I want to do this, 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 and this. But in all honesty, to be successful academically, the sooner you can narrow your focus and truly be the tip of that spear, that, that ultra specialist, probably the sooner you're going to be academically successful. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you.